So, what other things? There's one problem that runs through this entire literature. Okay, so here's the deal. You are a, uh, you're a gazelle. You're a female gazelle, and you have read lots of zoology, and you know all about this handicap principle, and you know the fact that big, dramatic, secondary sexual characteristics on guys is a marker of better immune systems and more fertile sperm and all sorts of great stuff. So you go out of your way to go and find one of those guys, you mate with him, and you've just given birth. So knowing what you know, what you of course now realize is you've got a great kid on your hands that have all these terrific genes from that jutting jawed antelope guy you mated with, and you better make sure this kid survives because they have an enormous potential for having a big reproductive success later on. What do you do? You expend more calories in taking care of them. This has been shown in all sorts of species. Mate various birds and various bird species, mate females with males who, have, who are more attractive versus mating them with less attractive. And what you see is that the females who have mated with the more attractive males give birth to bigger eggs. That's interesting. Okay, so you're seeing the evidence of the good genes coming from the guy. Male genes have nothing to do with egg size. It is how much protein the mother puts into the egg production and the egg development. And what you see is she makes this a self-fulfilling prophecy. In a lot of species now, it has been shown that when females mate with more attractive males, they put more effort into having the offspring survive. The offspring survive better. And yes, what do you know? You really do want to mate with guys with big antlers and that sort of thing. This big problem with self-fulfilling stuff. So that's a confound that has run through the field. Another confound, and here is one that shows how many species are far less distant from us than one might think. This was work by a guy named Lee Dugotkin at University of Kentucky. And what he does is study ospreys or some kind of bird thing that runs around. And what he does is he first gets a male and female osprey and he introduces them to each other. And what he looks for are circumstances where the magic does not occur. There is no chemistry between them. The female rejects the guy. And at that point, what he does is in the next round, he makes the male appear to be very popular. He puts the male here and he takes a whole bunch of stuffed female birds and puts them around in a circle around him, gawking at him with rapt admiration and just frozen in their place at the wonders of like the coloration on his bills from eating who knows whose feces. And what you see then is the female who spurned him is now more likely to do solicitative uh, courting gestures with him. In other words, she's jumping on a bandwagon. And this has now been shown in a number of species. What's the logic of this? This is exactly what secondary sexual characteristics are about. I don't understand why anyone considers that to be attractive. This individual does nothing for me, but if it appears to be the case that those traits are very popular and thus those traits are predictors of being able to pass on many copies of your genes, I sure want my kids to have those traits. And thus this bandwagon effect. So all of these are versions of just shallow, shallow, horrible values versions of who one looks for in a mate. But then, of course, we go to all the pair bonding species. And as we heard from many lectures ago, the rituals in lots of those species of male courtship built around showing that they are a competent parent, showing that they can do some rough approximation of acting like a mother to these babies. What's that about? That's the whole world of male birds doing courtship by bringing worms and feeding the mother and showing, look, I know what kind of things we eat. I know how to bring a worm. By the time you get to pair bonding species, the rituals and what is attractive are often markers not of fertility, but of parenting skill, parenting competence. Flip the other way, in most non-human primate species that have been looked at, when are females most attractive to males independent of the size of their estrus swelling when they've already had a couple of kids? 
Females the first time out rounds of ovulating are less preferred than females who have had a number of kids already. If it is the same thing going on, what she has already proven is she's competent enough that she didn't kill the kids by dropping them out of the tree at various points, this being as a marker, again, of competence.